Hello and welcome to Tex Talks. I am Tex and today I am talking to a proudly independent singer-songwriter whose creative confidence shines through courtesy of her captivating vocals and stripped-backed compositions. Having developed her bluesy folk sound busking on the streets of Berlin, she has caught the ears of a community of music lovers the world over with her honest storytelling and raw, beautiful voice. I am, of course, talking about the uniquely captivating Alice Phoebe Lou. But first, we need to mention our awesome studio sponsors for this season. SDFD Studio, a world-class recording facility opened by local music specialists, Sit the Folk Down. Their services range from audio and post-production work to mixing and mastering and everything else audio-related. Get in touch with them at studio at stfd.co.za for all your recording and music-related needs. Mix Room Studios is a boutique, electronic music-focused mixing and mastering studio. And if you're making cool electronic music, you probably need your beats to be polished. So hit Mix Room Studio up at info at mixroomstudios.com for more info. Alice, welcome. It's been, it's been a while since I've last seen you. How has the start of the new decade been treating you? I think it's been quite a rough start, actually, to be honest. I feel like it's the case for everyone. I think it's it's that um, delusion that we get ourselves into, like, new year, new me, everything's going to be better. I can just wipe all the cuck away and start again. Um, and then reality hits you and you're like, oh, it, you know, it, the new year thing is just symbolic and, you know, we still still got our same struggles and, and all of those things. Um, but right now, I feel like my year is starting now. <laughs> I feel like that was just a trial period, those, the first month and a half or so. January lasted like 15 years. <laughs> exactly. Basically. And I think also I just, um, I had come to South Africa after touring for a long time I played over 100 shows last year so I was kind of I never really stopped and my band came down with me this time and usually they uh, come at a later stage so it the, the tour almost continued um and then I had a bit of a bit of a crash when they left in mid-Jan um but that crash is always very necessary for me I don't see that as like a negative thing when you just kind of need to take stock and suddenly just yeah change change the speed and the pace of of life a little bit so that's what I've been going through um but I'm I'm in a very good place right now I feel I feel very happy with the way things have been and I'm looking very forward to the things that are coming so oh I can't wait to talk about all all of the things that have happened over the last few years because it's been a it's been a while since I've seen you, but also to hear about all of the very exciting things that you're working on that are coming up this year. But I mean, you mentioned the the speed and the sort of change of pace when you come back to Cape Town, where you can sort of re regroup and recenter. And I know you grew up in in Komiki, which is like it's. That, that that's chilled the epit- that's the epitome of like chilled and and <laughs> laid back. So I w- and I know on social media you talk very fondly about like your mom and your brothers and you seem like a very close knit family. So what was it like growing up in the the um, uh, what I'm sure is a very chilled, very laid back Lou household? I mean, you know, things are always a bit different on the on the inside as they are to the the outer world and Komiki definitely is a very very chill place to be Um, I grew up in a family of four and we're all pretty strong personalities so um, there's that but I have very loving parents and I'm very very fortunate uh, the way that I have grown up the the way that I started my career has been determined by the the kind of principles that I grew up on and um, especially having a very, very strong, independent mother. Um, so I'm very, very grateful for those things. And I take a lot of inspiration from growing up here to my life in Berlin. So. You know, it's crazy. The first time I met you, I interviewed you for another online radio show that I had um, before you played Tuesdays on Fire at Anne Union, um, which was the first time that I also saw you perform. And I remember you came into studio and you hooked up your guitar and you opened your voice, you open, you open your mouth. And I was like, how is this 
voice coming out of this, I don't know, I think you were like 19, 20 yeah. at the time. And I just remember being so blown away. And my producer in the booth looked at me and he was like, what is going on right now? I'm so confused by this insane talent. And like, I, that night as well, like I remember the whole crowd just being so completely like entranced by you. And it's just you and your guitar. And I feel like it's very powerful to just have you, your guitar and your voice. But what are your, some of your earliest memories that, that you have about you interacting with with music? So I guess it starts with my parents' record collection and just being exposed to a lot of different genres. My, my parents didn't have like one kind of music that they listened to. Um, and that was always really special. I also had a lot of um, like kind of musical, my parents had musical friends that I looked up to and my mom plays a bunch of instruments herself. So it was kind of always around um, but that was never really my focus. I didn't grow up dreaming of being a musician. I thought that at the end of school, I was going to go and study um, anthropology and uh, at UCT. So th it wasn't my dream. Uh, but that all kind of changed once I started traveling, started mm. writing some songs and and realized... I guess the effect that that I had on people, it's, it started to show and the the excitement of playing on the street. I just found something, you know, that feeling where you where you really just suddenly realize that you're so comfortable and at ease doing something um, that I'd never really found in one thing before. And I found that on the streets of Berlin, um, which was initially out of necessity, kind of, I'm traveling, I don't want to ask my parents for money, I got to do this. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, I'm really happy with the way that it happened because uh, I feel like I, I had many years where I was kind of self-conscious about the fact that I'd never gone to music school, I'd never really had a formal education in music. And I felt like, fuck, if I'd just started earlier, imagine you know the wealth of knowledge that I could have on music now and the kind of music that I'd be making but I realized especially in the last couple of years that the value as well of, of being a musician that that is self-taught that doesn't necessarily have music theory as a strength but has storytelling and songwriting in a different way as a strength um, and it's something that I'm starting to appreciate about myself more feeling less self-conscious that I'm not a trained musician but that I can tell stories through a few simple chords you know and that's that's been a really nice uh, place to come to to realize that sometimes not having an education on the thing that you're in you're in can be a strength in a way as well um, that's been something that's been really nice to acknowledge because I always had this sense of like mm, I'm not good enough you know mm, I think I, th I think a lot of us do yeah like when it comes to creative prowess that we have or that we're unsure of but one thing that I just learned about you know I didn't know that I had no idea that you weren't uh, you hadn't studied music at all that's in incredible <laughs> I think I mean it makes it even more special um from yeah from my perspective because it's just it's you are you are exactly who you are I think maybe um honing your talents busking on the streets as well in Berlin it's kind of it's very very raw very exposed so I want to take it back to just after you matriculated you get on a plane you go to Amsterdam you're dancing you're fire dancing which I also didn't know about you oy, that's oy, oy. insane um <laughs> you know trying to make money, doing your thing, and somebody says to you, you've got to go to Berlin. And I feel like with you, it's impossible to have a conversation and not talk about Berlin because the city is so intrinsically linked to you and you are so intrinsically linked to the city. Um, what is your first impression when you get to Berlin? What's the, fir what's the first thing that enters your mind? I walked down the street um, and it was in quite an alternative part of the city where I've actually... Uh, like live at the moment and there was just so much activity happening on the streets so many different kinds of people that held themselves high without a sense of being judged even if they were kind of looking outside of the norm or you know expressing something that isn't uh, I don't know it's usually socially acceptable 
And that was literally it. I walked down the street and just saw just such a wealth of expression and and I couldn't believe it, to be honest, because I'd heard of, you know, these golden eras in different parts of the world. Paris you know, in the 20s. New York in the 70s. Mm. And, and these kinds of things felt like they were living in books and records. And, and that's, honestly, it sounds a little bit romantic, but that's literally what I felt when I was walking down the streets in Berlin. Uh, the sense that, wow, there's still a place in the world where you know you can feel as though anything is possible and where there's the sense that things are not over regulated because most big cities in the world you know as amazing as they are have the sense of just being so fucking over regulated that you just you 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 don't feel like art and expression can can really know no bounds you know and is and it a, is it an affordable city I've never been there before. No, it's not. It's really expensive and no one should ever go there. <laughs> no, it is um, it is really affordable. Okay. Um, comparatively to a lot of other parts of Europe, especially when I moved there uh, in 2012, I was paying like 250 euros for a room. Like, and you compare that to London. I mean, it's just a whole different situation. But that's the thing is Berlin's kind of magnetism in lots of different ways because obviously there's the alternative part of the city that draws in artists and creative types from all over the world people mm -hmm. just kind of like land there and get stuck there and can't leave um like like I did uh but there's also you know a lot of other interesting things happening in fashion in tech companies and whatever so it's such a bubbling city that uh things are changing things have been changing very very quickly and at the moment, it's less of a problem of it being uh, too expensive, but more just like there is nowhere to live. There's really? just so people that have lived there their entire lives spend a year looking for a, an apartment. That's the, the situation at the moment. So it's quite wild. And, and I feel quite sorry for for local Berliners who, you know, on the one hand, love the multicultural nature of the city and, and want people to be able to find their home there it's 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 one of those places that just you know for all the misfits of the world it's 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 home it just feels like home um but at the same time they're like fuck berlin got too cool it just got too cool and now i can't find a place to live and because it, there's and too it, many people here <laughs> exactly and it doesn't seem to like be slowing down either Not like at all. i mean andre leo and lucy kruger from medicine boy who've you know now live there and then we've got by benico that are also moving there and like south Tor african moved there. Tor moved there yeah beatenberg i see rob there every yeah. second day so like I feel like there's this influx of South African creatives as well. Absolutely. So when you're there, do you see a lot of each other? I mean, do you sort of bump into each other in the street, like when, when you're all busking? Or, I mean, is it is it is it that kind of, do you run in the same circles? Is the creative community that small? So in 2012, when I moved there, bumping into a South African was so rare. It just didn't happen. Um, and now over the last few years, I guess a lot of people started paving the way for, um, you know, people getting more excited to go there because there's already a community there that they can, you know, they don't have to start from scratch. They mm. can already have a connection or two. So now there's, there is definitely a growing amount of South African artists there. I would say um, you do uh, cross paths quite a lot. You help each other out, um, help each other get the kind of documents you need for your artist visa or whatever. I'm lucky enough Super to have a, a passport, a uh, Belgian passport. So Ooh, I never ticket. needed that. Yeah. Mm. Golden ticket, baby. It's, I mean, it becomes so arbitrary when when you know it's it's just a matter of a little booklet it feels super weird but I have also helped people um to get the kind of documentation they need to uh, get art artist visas but at the same time I don't I've never been that kind of person that is like um so overly proudly South African that I'll just stick with my my people and like that'll be my community wherever I go you know so hashtag I'm staying yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> so I've just kind of decided like 
I don't um, go out of my way to to join and connect the South African artists in in Berlin because that already happens quite quite easily and yeah it just kind of everyone slots into this scene and it becomes less about where you're from and just more about what you do. So you spoke earlier about busking and you spoke fondly about it but you know with the ups come the downs mm. and I'm sure that you've had a few experiences over the years busking that can't have been entirely positive absolutely so what what have been some of the pitfalls over the years of your busking experiences in Berlin but then mm. also around the world because you you do busk in when you get the opportunity you, you do busk wherever you can mm. yeah look I think people underestimate how difficult it is to be a woman busking on the streets it's fucking difficult really and um that's why I've seen so many people try, so many women try, and actually not have the strength to continue, um, which I don't blame them for. I don't at all because you can have really hard experiences and just re- feel unsafe, basically. Um, and I've definitely been there. I had to do a lot of growing up very quickly. And um, I'm someone that's very good at forming kind of relationships and communities um, within those circles um, to create understanding, to create support um, so that you always have people that have got your back wherever you go. And that's been a beautiful learning experience. And the, you know, the busking communities of the world are all so different. I've been, you know, I've, I've dipped into so many scenes like that. In Amsterdam, for instance, it's incredibly competitive because really yeah because you only get they only give out a very small amount of actual busking licenses there and so I experienced my first like really bad experience happened in Amsterdam most of the buskers uh, were kind of street artists that would do these shows with getting out of a straight jacket or doing like some crazy shit and and they had been doing it for like 10 15 years they were generally men from uh, different english speaking com- countries of, around the world australia um the usa etc and they had usually were supporting some kind of addiction not to not to um you know slander addicts or anything like i definitely empathize with that but then obviously it's how you treat the people around you um and this one guy, I always kept my distance from him because he was quite aggressive. And I think he was addicted to speed um, and alcohol. And I was 19 years old, no, 18 years old, um, just out of high school. And I was fire dancing on <laughs> the late plane every night for like 30 minutes. And that's how I was getting by. And I was very non-intrusive. I understood that they had their own dynamics of how they do things and run the show. Um, But eventually he would always push my buttons, you know, Australian kind of alcoholic character, sorry, stereotype. He sounds divine. Yeah, he was stereo stereotype away. (laughs) And so he would he would always try to push my buttons and get a reaction out of me. And I saw that that was his tactic. So I would always lay low and let him have his whatever. And eventually he got to a point where he told me that he was going to follow me home and rape me. Wow. And he said it in front of three or four other busking men and not one person stood up for me no one like you know called him out for what he'd said and I was so shook by it I had to just like I didn't want to see him to see me cry but I could feel I was gonna cry Mm. so I just like took a walk around the block had a little cry and came back um and this guy (laughs) on the same night ended up getting into a fight and getting beaten up. I don't comment. I don't know. <laughs> but it was it was a very, very big um, wake-up call and learning experience for me. Um, and I ended up changing my spot and deciding not to be around th- that character or the people that had not defended me. Um, but that was, that was a hard one, to be honest, especially because I knew him. I was kind of friendly with him. And it's scary when you're alone in a city halfway across the world from home and somebody is, is threatening you like that. Um, but then in general on the streets, I mean, you've got to understand that you become pretty used to 
being shouted at, being grabbed, um, having people on all sorts of drugs coming in and trying to trying to just squash the magic that you're creating in that moment, you know, because I think that's exactly what happens is you're, you're creating this beautiful, cozy bubble that people want to engage with. And you, somebody who's maybe having a fucking shit time on the inside and uh, is sees the light, sees the, the warmth and just wants to destroy it, you know. And um, that's also something that I've learned to understand and empathize with on another level. And then comes the responsibility, because I think when you have, I sometimes have 100 to 200 people there standing, watching me, um, appreciating me, looking up to me in that moment. If someone comes and tries to destroy the moment, how do you engage with them? And it is so important to not treat someone as though they are lower than you, especially mm-hmm. if they are homeless or if they look like they've had a hard time. I've seen so many buskers treat other people like they are lower than them, you know. And so I think that's been an incredible learning experience as well as just trying to treat people with the utmost respect, even if they're acting like a piece of shit sometimes, you know, and trying to be stern and stand your ground while still treating other people like human beings. I mean, you, you might not have gone to any sort of music tertiary educational institution, but you definitely went to the school of hard knocks. And I think that you're so (laughs) much better off for it, to be really honest. I'm so happy with my, my education on on the streets, to be honest. And then also the, the level of just, you know, you share a space with with a lot of homeless people, a lot of drug dealers, um, all sorts of kinds of people, and and you learn to to share. You learn to to yeah, ha- like use this public space and not have like a hierarchy. And it's taught me so many lessons, and I think definitely made me understand other people a lot better. That's another thing I've learned about you today. Who would have known that Alice Phoebe Lou is so gangster? <laughs> so I want to talk about your your TED Talk performance because in my mind that was a huge turning point for you. I think it's been viewed like just over two million times or something stupid like that. And I feel like that that TED Talk really launched you to a global audience. But very interestingly made everybody back home go – like who's this girl (laughs) and what's she doing in Berlin and oh my god she's such an insane talent what are your thoughts when you think back on that TED talk now or that that performance specifically and and the craziness and the hype that came with that I found it kind of ridiculous to be honest I was like really this video (laughs) this is what people are like recognizing me for right now like you know I was proud of it uh, on one level I look back on it now I'm like wow I was so nervous it was one of my first times playing like on a proper stage and I I didn't I, I didn't really know what I was going to say they'd asked me just to perform three songs they hadn't told me to to say anything in between or anything um, and then those few things that I did say seemed to resonate with people it made me more confident to use uh gigs and performances as an opportunity to also raise certain issues talk about things made me feel more comfortable in doing that because sometimes you like question yourself like am I talking too much is this too much information for people that just want to like be entertained or whatever but that definitely broke that for me which was cool but I was surprised because I was also very used to this like kind of nice slow trajectory of um how my career was building on kind of like a solid foundation but I'd constantly already before that been turning down labels and um just basically stopping any of those snap career moments that like propel you to another dimension all of a sudden because that's not really how I ever wanted to do things to be honest I just I'd seen so many people go through the label thing especially with bigger labels and how um it just affected 
them and their music in a negative way and how change can, their how, lives. Yeah, how it can fuck negatively. everything up. It can really fuck everything up. Yeah. And so I, I'd really made that executive decision to to stick to my guns and to build something on a solid foundation and not feel like I just want to like, you know, click my fingers and be somewhere else. Because and I'm so glad that that happened because I feel like there's a lot of times where a young person especially is kind of whipped up in that world and of course there's artist friendly labels there's amazing people doing amazing things out there don't get me wrong but often they'll snatch someone up um, and they'll go from you know zero to hero or whatever you want to call it and not have learned the lessons to get there and so when they when they're on the other side it it's very hard for them to to understand how to to continue because they haven't worked hard and learned the lessons to get there and it, it makes it I think quite difficult to to move forward from that place you feel like your creativity and and everything that made you the artist that you were um are a little bit like lost on the wayside um so so yeah um that was like the first moment where I was like okay I could see the sudden shift in like people realizing who I was I guess and um when I got back to South Africa that year I was not to be like oh my god it's so hard being so popular but like <laughs> it was it was just a little bit overwhelming like I would go to a party and someone would be like hey you're the girl the gentle and I'd be like mm, hey a little awkward and shy and that was that was the first time that I realized that South African fans are hectic sometimes like I don't know I find it very funny because like I don't get it all over the world where I'll you know walk into a restaurant in Cape Town and someone will shout from the other side oh my god it's Alice Phoebe Lou guys and you're just like hello I'm a human being why are you shouting at me can everyone just go back to doing what they're doing you know just like a it was a funny thing for me and it, it was hard to get used to because it's not I don't like being treated special I feel very weird about it um I always try to after shows whenever I play a show I'm there doing the merch um trying to show people that I'm not better than you I'm not I don't like being put on a pedestal I don't like you know it's one thing to admire someone it's another thing to try and like turn them into like a god or a guru or something bigger than you and I've never felt comfortable with that idea so um it can be interesting sometimes I, I can't imagine that opening for Rodriguez could have made that no. any any better no it's like and sometimes I have moments where I just you know, and shame, I understand, like, everybody, like, I have empathy for people who do this, but at the same time, I'm, like, blown away. I'll be eating some food, and someone will just slide in for a selfie without asking, without, and I'm just there, like, wow, how did the, the how did everything lead to the point where you thought that this was okay? <laughs> like, I'll be you know, have a bit drunk with some friends or whatever and someone will just, you know, grab me or, like, demand my attention. And it's just something that people should acknowledge, you know, that everybody is just a a human being and, um, you know. (laughs) Also, somewhere on the internet, there's a photo of you, a selfie of you, eating a sandwich with some person who's like smiling really broadly they're like oh my god this is my favorite thing ever (laughs) oh my god no it's a it's a funny one it is a funny one but I like as I said like I always try to be as kind to people in those situations as possible while now still I've come to the point where I assert my boundaries better and I'm so happy I'm there I feel like I grew up so much from the point where I felt like I always had to say yes to anybody Mm. to the point where I'm like actually I really don't feel like taking a selfie right now I can give you a little hug though if you feel like it and you know maybe like a little high five or something but um I feel like asserting those boundaries is super important saying no is super important the way you do it is also super important and and learning how to do that yeah is also takes years definitely but that's also super important yeah. and I like one of the things that I think that you've done really well we spoke a little uh, b- briefly about record labels indie labels aggregators major labels um uh, how they can be a help but how they can also be a hindrance and mm-hmm. I feel like you as an independent artist I know that you you know work with a team there are 
people around you, but exclusively, you know, everything you curate. Yeah. You are in charge of the image that you portray. And I know that, um, I mean, at the end of last year, you released Skin Crawl, which is, I mean, really a really beautiful music video and a really beautiful song, um, which obviously deals with some pretty hectic subject matter, but you released it with a press release that you wrote detailing that incident that happened in New mm. York where you were drugged and then almost um, assaulted, but thankfully you were not. Um, and I just, I, I felt like that was firstly really brave to do, super, super brave, but also you did it in such a, like beautiful way because you had control over the words that came out totally over yeah. that how 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 important do you think it is for artists to not give away all of themselves to still own a piece of themselves especially or of themselves especially when it comes to something like that press release that you wrote because that went out everywhere that was on I think it was debuted on Fade, uh, yeah. If I'm, yeah, if I'm not mistaken. And that was beautiful because that was you in your own words. Totally. I think with something like that, especially, I really felt like I needed to be able to have some context for people to to digest that video with. Because on the one hand, I'm trying to, you know, get quite a strong uh, idea across. And the video um, was, was you walking on top of a chorus of men, yeah. basically. Yeah. Using men as, as furniture and stuff. And of course, I got a bit of backlash for that. Fair enough. Um, good. <laughs> it's all good. It, it happens. But much less than I expected. And I think that the reason why the backlash was much less than anticipated was because of giving people context, because of the fact that I'm not doing this from a place of hate and that I'm not trying to, um, you know, make people feel better bad I'm just trying to get across a, a point of view that a lot of people experience um, and I think I think everybody approaches their kind of PR differently and I can respect the fact that a lot of artists want to make the music and then have the other stuff done for them I really do respect and understand that but for my music it's my name it's my history it's my everything about me is attached to my project it's not a persona so making sure that you can explain yourself and articulate yourself properly that your intentions are articulated and using songs as an opportunity to uh, you know spread ideas and and make people feel less alone and heard and all of those things that's that's such a beautiful opportunity and so I've always seen it as such um, and I think that uh, yeah communicating ideas is is important giving people information and context and background is uh, just strengthens the the message and the deliverance of of those things so mm. I want to talk about the song that was shortlisted for best original song at the Oscars two years ago because that's huge I mean that's that's not a small feat um and it's a it's a stunning stunning song she is absolutely divine and um it soundtracked the bombshell yes uh, which is the documentary about Hedy Lamarr exactly who was a actress and a she was inventor a, exactly yes. she's an inventor she's responsible for the the technology that uh, is used in Wi-Fi and all wireless communication. Incredible. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. You're the schooling me hard awesome. today. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. And yeah, I, I basically was reached out to by the director and uh, Susan Sarandon was the, the producer of the, the film. Um, and they, yeah, they wanted the song for the film. I was super happy. It was cool because I got to go over there and meet them and go to the premiere. And actually it was really funny because I sat there watching the film and I was so wrapped up in the story because it's such a beautiful story that... I'd forgotten that my song was on it because it only comes right in the end. And so, like, I'm watching this film, like, totally into it. And then suddenly my song's playing and it's, like, Tribeca Film Festival, like, massive theatre. And I'm like, that's me. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Just blushing over there. Um, so it was a really cool experience. I was really, really happy with the whole thing. Um, and it came at a really nice time. And it was also just such a 
powerhouse of women that were behind the documentary. Um, so it was it was a really cool experience. I was really happy. And then you go from one sort of powerhouse uh, project to another with Maisie Williams oh, yeah, from, true. <laughs> from, oh my God, from Game of Thrones. And when I saw that, like my, the, my inner geek was freaking out because I just thought that Galaxies was such a beautiful piece of art. Like you had her saying the poem in the beginning and it was shot in the planetarium. Planetarium. In Berlin, yeah. And it just, everything about it was so expertly curated. How did that come about? So Macy um, has been launching an app called Daisy, which is super cool because she's she's really young and has such a vision for the things that she can do outside of acting and using her fame to do awesome shit, basically. And this app is about connecting creatives and uh, a platform for um, profile profiles, putting a profile as an artist and connecting people. And uh, in the pursuit of launching that app, she wanted to do a bunch of content with Majestic Casual. And I... Um, happened to my manager's office happens to be next door to Majestic Casuals so I have a good relationship with them and so she w- wanted to do a bunch of different content with them and one of the ideas was to, to collaborate on an, a live session with an artist and she, they presented a bunch of artists she seemed to be interested in me we had like one phone call and uh, we just had like a good vibe so it, it all went super smoothly it was very even though it was orchestrated it felt very natural the way that things things uh, progressed also i hate to admit it never seen game of thrones i know please alice i'm sorry what's going on right I now i think it just got ahead of me you know all of a sudden it was like a million seasons in and i was like fuck i gotta start from the beginning this is gonna take up too much of my time i need to get really sick and then just watch it all that's that's the idea you, you need to Except come back i like oh. know what happens now because everyone was raving about it so i'm like what's the point now no alice you're a last cause okay I know. no i can't okay so this interview's think over think about this think about this i mean I obviously didn't tell her like I've never seen Game of Thrones but like what what was actually so cool about our connection is that I wasn't a fangirl and I think everyone else is so you know everyone else that she meets has a way of treating her that is quite you know you're the superstar and I'm a lowly mortal. You're um, Arya you're Arya Stark. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Of the House of Stark. Exactly. Like, like Neil. You, Bend totally, I know exactly what that means. And um <laughs> and so I love I how think, you don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> I know. Your mind is being blown. I can see it in front of me. And so yeah, so our communication was so authentic and and real and without that kind of context and layer that we just got along really well and I think she she also appreciated me treating her like like a like a human mm-hmm. and um, <laughs> not a member of House of Stark exactly got you and um yeah so the whole thing went down really well it was super sweet and I'd been playing in that planetarium I think that was the 12th show I've done in the last three years there because we started it as a, a concert series of just three shows and it just went down so well that we just kept kept doing them and kept working on them improving them so that it could all be one really unique concert experience and I'm super super happy with the way that it's um kind of progressed and where it's at now uh, and we we are also pitching it to other planetariums so we want to do one in Tokyo for instance one in um, Cape Town one in Cape Town ah here we go yeah. okay now we're getting to the good stuff yeah. <laughs> um because it's it's something different it's really really special yeah I think one of the things that's so unique to your journey is how, I mean, what we've been saying throughout this whole interview is how you've done things your own way. Yeah. And you've, be able, you've been able to be the sort of, you know, captain of your own ship and how your music is, you know, how your story is told and how your persona is put out. It's all, yeah, it's all expertly curated by you which is great and also we were talking off air before we started recording this about the events that you put on towards the end of last year beginning of this year in Cape Town independently 
and how incredibly well these events that you've put on have done and how totally blown away you are. And again, to reinforce that, like it's so super important to be able, well, I mean, I think you're very lucky to be able to call the own, your own shots and curate Absolutely. your own lineups and put on your own events. Um, but do you think, I mean, I know that Berlin, you know, you're three months, two months here, three months here, and then you're the rest of the year in Berlin. Do you, do you think you'll ever put down roots anywhere? Or, or do you think like you're happy with how things are going at the moment? I have no idea, to be mm. honest. I change a lot. Um, if there's something that I know about myself is that I change and that change is very good for me. So I, I decide quite overtly not to predict that change in order for it to happen naturally as I grow older and as my values or my circumstances change or the things that I want to surround myself change. And so I let that be quite an organic process. So who knows? Okay. But the one thing that I do know is that I've been really excited to get to the point where my you know my ability to draw a crowd is at the place that it is now um in order to use that to um uplift and promote other artists and that's been something that I've been working on for years now I've put on shows and parties in Berlin for quite a long time where I you know use my pool to just get artists that I love that I think deserve a bigger audience onto the stage um and that's one of my biggest joys is is being an event curator and helping using my success to help other artists um get further and to bring that now to South Africa in a real way has been so rewarding I've been working with my friend Quito who is honestly a, a gem in South Africa in terms of what he does for South African music and how his fingers in on the pulse and so us as a team has just been so amazing we put on a festival on the 11th of January called We Here and we sold it out we had 700 ticket holders and a bunch of friends and I also set up a line of communication where anybody could apply for a cheaper ticket or a free ticket mm -hmm. which is something that I also think is incredibly important in South Africa is like I feel like it's your responsibility as somebody who's um, creating events or you know uh, doing culture or art to make sure that you at least have something in place where you are um you know, aware of the difference between, um, you know, some 20 rand for one person is 200 rand for another person here. And you need to be able to make your events inclusive and to promote that and to, to make that the standard. And it was so amazing because I just had people emailing me with loads of different circumstances and I would just ask them, how much are you comfortable to pay? Mm. And It was such a beautiful process and there were so many people that were so grateful that wouldn't have been able to come to the event that that did. And I feel like it was yeah, such a success in that sense as well. Um, and such amazing artists as well. And then, of course, suddenly there was nothing to do after that festival. So me and Quito were like, let's do another one. And we put up an event on the Tuesday for an event on Sunday. And it was called Now We Hear. And we got 550 people to come. And it was a nice crossover between um, DJs and live acts. And it went down so well. I think people also in Cape Town really love spontaneous events. But obviously no like event organizer in their right mind wants to do one here because of how bloody fake, flaky everyone is never. here. Never. I would never exactly. put my neck on the chopping block like that ever. And that's why I am in a position where I can do that because, you know, I can get people over. I have, I have you know, some sort of um, you know, name here. So just to be able to do that was so exciting and so fun and showed me the potential for what I can do here in the future. And I've got big ideas and I'm very excited to, to do more events here and to just support the scene here because it's so important. And there's also just a sense of just showing people basic concert etiquette, you know, showing them how you can come and listen, you know, like, like 
maybe shut your fucking mouth and listen <laughs> as well. <laughs> and I'm pretty good at commanding a crowd now. That's I, I would say I'm I've I've yeah, I've learned the art of of making a space consistent and showing people that how nice it is that we're all in this together, you know. And I played a solo show on that second show. A solo show in Cape Town in front of 550 people and everyone was chip still <laughs> and that never happens so just being able to show people that that's possible training people to buy their tickets in advance those kinds of things and contributing to that like n normalizing that kind of event culture i think is very important here it's and 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 there and there you have it uh alice phoebe lou singer songwriter fire dancer and um south africa's newest hottest event promoter hey. teach me your ways Alice <laughs> teach me how to make people shut up when, like, oh right. my oh my god for real <laughs> no but thank you so much for coming through such a pleasure you've got this golden joining us in studio thanks for joining us for another text talks check out textinthecity.com for more episodes don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on apple music and listen to text talks on all good streaming platforms from myself tex our producers jonathan ings and matt lutz and our assistant researcher and collaborator al clapper catch y'all on the flip side